Charlie, it's yours. Take it away. Thank you. Uh, for next talk, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Felipa Rijo Ferreira. Uh, Felipa, please tell us about your living history. Hi, thank you so much for the invitation. And I, I think this is really an amazing initiative. I had the pleasure to watch a few of the other speakers' uh, presentations from the past. And that was super exciting. A little bit of uh, added stress that maybe I shouldn't have watched them. But, you know, diversity, I guess it's this. Different path, different presentations, and, and so on. So I just started. So, yes, I'm Philippa Rija Ferreira. I just started my group at University of California, Berkeley, where we study circadian rhythms in parasitic diseases. And I will tell you a little bit more about that too. But as I just started, I'm going to mostly tell you about how I got until here, right? And so I'm originally from Portugal, from Lisbon, this beautiful city you see here. But actually my parents' uh, home is across the river uh, on this other side in a little town called Almada. This is just 10 minutes away by ferry or by uh, car. And you have this big river and then the ocean right here. And my family was very big and it still is very big into sailing. And so that really get, got me very exposed to being in a boat since I was very, very young. Here's me with my mom and with my dad here, seemingly having a little bit more fun than the other two pictures. Uh, but this uh, really took me into actually joining a sailing club when I was like nine or 10 and really starting to participate then eventually in regattas and championships. So a lot of my childhood growing up was in a tiny little boat in the middle of the ocean with strong winds and waves. And I think that really shaped the way uh, I approach life now. I think it really made me of course, very scared and humbled about the, you know, massive winds and waves, but also fascinated to it and having to trust your training into the defiance of the unknown. And that's very much in science too. It takes a, like in a different project that we don't know anything about this new technology and you have to go for it. You have to just trust and still go throw yourself out there. And so I think that in part has been kind of like that long-term training of it. It's also not very physical, but very tactical as well, sailing. You have to really be paying attention into how you feel the wind and how you pay attention to the patterns of where the currents are coming from and the, the, the winds, um, uh, gusts and so just that's I think the same thing that you have to be paying a lot of attention into the details and I think that overall has been something that I've de developed uh, over time and time management I spent my entire Saturdays and Sundays the entire childhood until I was uh, in after college right and in and that made me having to pay a lot of attention and be present when I am doing something. So when I'm at the seminars or at classrooms, I didn't have time to then go back and study the, because I wanted to go sailing, right? So just kind of like finding the time to do what you really appreciate, I think, is something that I still try very hard to do, right? To have the two things. Also, sailing is a very male-dominated sport, so I have always been the only girl in any of the sailing teams, either when we were in a big yacht or when it was like these tiny little boats, every other uh, kid was a boy. And so that really, since I was very young, that made me kind of a surprise. Why is that? And so I've always been volunteering since I was a teenager in all the summer camps to uh, during um, sailing summer camps to really recruit more uh, girls into the sailing club in particular. And so I was very successful in getting a lot of my friends. So just all together, just made me aware of diversity and making sure that we are all uh, allowed in. And so this is just a, a few more pictures of sailing, as you can see, it's very cool. <laughs> but uh, how about science? Science was not a family legacy uh, at all. None of my parents were in science. But by chance, uh, my dad was working as a manager, marketing uh, uh, person on a pharmaceutical company. And that company gave a microscope to the kids of the collaborators on some Christmas. And these really marked me. I spent 
years and years going downstairs to the parking lot of the apartment, getting little leaves and flowers and little uh, insects, bringing them up, watching them under the microscope for hours and then letting go. And I think another uh, really key aspect that shaped uh, my interest for science was these a junior out of college, amazing seventh grade biology teacher that was telling us that spent a lot of time uh, with us kids and explaining how it was to be in a lab, how, how designing the experiments. Just the fascination that she had really encouraged me to also want to know more about it. And just in general, let's face it, I didn't really like blood. So medicine itself was not a path. And so I ended up joining um, in college molecular cell biology uh, course. And that's when I really became fascinated now for microbes and specifically pathogens and how they interact with the immune system and innovated and we have co-evolved for millions of years together, how these all um, take shape. And so I ended up getting an Erasmus fellowship and uh, went to to the UK, to Imperial College London, to do a, a one-year research project for my master's studying immunology of, uh, of a viral infection. And I really, this was the real first time that I spent um, uh, in a lab and tried to be a scientist, and I really loved it. And so I decided that I wanted to continue these as a career path, uh, but I was not fully sure of what do I wanted to do. And so I returned to Portugal and I started looking for a, a technician position and in an immunology lab that I thought I knew, right? And by chance, there was this junior scientist, Luisa Figueiredo, who was just starting her lab studying epigenetics, so gene expression regulation of parasites, so not at all in the host uh, interaction, but she uh, got a hold of my CV, reached out, and basically showed so much enthusiasm for uh, her own research that convinced me that maybe this was the the path I should do and I should uh, join her lab. So I was the first uh, person to join her team, and eventually I got accepted into a graduate program in Porto, so three hours north of Lisbon. And this uh, the uh, graduate program is. It was very special because they gave you the opportunity to come up with your own project. So I came back to Louisa and asked whether she would uh, support the idea of still studying the parasite she was studying, sleeping sickness, but really trying to understand why does it cause sleeping sickness? What is that the disruption of the parasite causes was very understudied. And she was extremely, extremely supportive. And she said, yes, if I was to find a collaborator that was the expert in the neuroscience, so in the in the sleep or circadian field. And that's when I uh, reached out and pitched these to Joe Takahashi at UT Southwestern in Dallas. And so together uh, during my PhD, we really tackled this question and show that the sleeping sickness parasite is able to accelerate, so to disrupt the clock of the host. And all together, this really um, kind of raised a very fundamental question, which was whether parasites themselves also had intrinsic clocks that allow them to anticipate the rhythmic changes that they are exposed to inside our bodies. And so I couldn't really let go of that idea. And so we went back to, to Lisbon so I could graduate a little bit more sailing now with Louisa and Joe, uh, my dad, and our my two um, thesis reviewers that is very common in Europe to have, and ended up deciding to come back to, to Dallas to do a postdoc uh, in the Takahashi lab. He has, had been so supportive of letting me really tackle the questions I wanted, and also being so curious that finding it interesting, even though we're not studying infectious diseases, to really uh, kind of like share that enthusiasm and motivation. And so that idea that maybe parasites had their own clocks could somehow explain why many different parasitic infections like malaria have these uh, rhythmic fevers that come and go at certain times of the day, that perhaps they are not only a consequence of the host, but also of the parasite. So during this time, which was really uh, great to be in his lab, I think a very key aspect was finding a science buddy. So by chance, this other postdoc, um, Victoria Costa Rodriguez, was 
really, really good friend. And we ended up really empowering each other during the entire time there, supporting, also making ourselves accountable when someone is not uh, doing it right. And so just this way, going through through our research projects together and like collaborating with one another, I think it really made it key to me. Like I really would... Um, uh, wouldn't want to do it any other way. She's actually just starting her own lab uh, soon at the NIH. So then the this was the wrap up of my postdoc and the uh, applying for faculty positions, and just started here last year as I as I mentioned. But I think here the key aspect was that sometimes you if you really want something and you think it, it might be a good fit is that you just apply because, for example, my particular uh, position, they were looking for someone doing field work, right? And you'd never know. So you may have the right fit, even if it doesn't sound like it. And so last year was a year of first. You can see here our first mosquitoes, first uh, mouse experiments, and also kind of moving across the country here to California. So altogether, just very quick final questions is that science is very hard so if you find a good reason to get out of the, of the lab a hobby please do it and also if you can do it with a team like either your own group or a science buddy that you can really trust I think it makes it much more fun take unexpected tours and opportunities and apply 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 don't self-exclude from the start and that's it Great, thank you very much, Philippa. And I'm uh, applauding on behalf of the audience. Um, I'll start with a question from the audience. Uh, you mentioned that doing science was not a family legacy. Uh, would you share some of the challenges and unique experiences you had as the first in your family to pursue a path in academia? Yes, and I, yes, thank you for asking this question. And I think a lot of people that end up doing uh, science is because they have been exposed to it uh, from maybe some family members or friends. And so it just makes it a little bit more knowledgeable into navigating how to do it. And I'm sure that um, like, like for me it was the first, but I'm sure for many others are the same. So it is definitely possible. It just takes a lot more of uh, being resourceful into getting other examples from actually people that are already in. So from either from me was the case was really from the people that were teaching at the university. So professors there that I would reach out and then, you know, peers that were two years more advanced in understanding how to navigate the things. If they, in my case, for example, the first time I had to figure out um, uh, something is like, oh, you can actually get fellowships to go and travel to another country to do a research with stipends. So I just was hearing this from other uh, other students that had gone through that. And it was like by mouth to mouth, right? So it has always been, I think, a little bit of a, a hurdle, not having someone guiding you through it, that no having, you know, as someone that I could closely uh, relate, but you find your own. That's what I, I feel, even if it's not already in your family, you find it. Great, great. Thank you for, for a great answer. And again, for a fantastic talk. Um, so um, thank you. And we'll uh, close the recording now and um, 